Hello and welcome to Take 6. I'm streaming executive producer Thomas Mates. Julie Broughton has the day off, but she should be returning tomorrow. Uh, we've got a lot to get to today, and so we're going to jump right into it. For starters, this weekend there was the big breaking news that there was a second assassination attempt on President, former President Donald Trump, uh, this time uh, at his golf resort uh, in South Florida. The FBI was able to, or the federal agents were able to, nab the suspected shooter and or would-be gunman rather and he is now facing federal charges we have new six anchor eric von aiken heading down to west palm beach right now heading into south florida uh he joins us now live from the road to tell us more about this story and and what's happened since yesterday when all this went down eric thank you so much for joining us uh, yeah, hey Thomas, hey everybody. Um, so we have just arrived. Uh, sorry about that. At uh, Trump International Golf Course um, here on Congress Avenue in West Palm Beach, uh, I'm with um, my photographer, uh, extra, extraordinaire uh, photojournalist Destiny Santana. And essentially, uh, Thomas, this was uh, us at New Six making a decision, saying, um, you know, there's obviously this is a, a a very important story. Uh, we know a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, we know there's already lots of questions and rumors and speculation spreading. So we said, let's come down here um, and let's see this for ourselves. Let's see exactly uh, what the Secret Service is laying out, how they explain that this happened. Uh, let's talk to the authorities down here um, and then report back to everybody at home. You know, because this is about as, as firsthand as it possibly gets. Uh, here's an example uh, of that. So, uh, Thomas, tell me if you can can see that. Basically, yes. I spun the phone around. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the entrance to Trump International. It just so happens that we are passing the entrance as we speak. Um, that is the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And it looks to me like they are limiting access to uh, everyone trying to enter this this uh, golf course. You know what? In fact, um, from what I could tell down that road, it's closed. Yeah. So um, no one can enter. And looking down that road for a few seconds, a few brief seconds, what we could see is um, looked like the, some of the FBI crime scene techs, the mm -hmm. crime scene van. They were processing the scene. We saw a lot of pictures yesterday of that suspect, Ryan Routh, Ruth, as they're calling him, R-O-U-T-H, who most recently lived in Hawaii. Um, again, the claim here from the Secret Service is, uh, there's this picture, is that he was hiding out in the bushes between holes five and six. So that would be on the east end of the golf course. And he had stuck the end of a rifle um, the muzzle end of a rifle through a chain link fence and through the bushes, the very thick bushes, um, pointing it at the golf course. Now, our understanding is that uh, former President Trump had not yet arrived at that hole. He was about a hole behind. The Palm Beach Sheriff's Office said that um, he was the suspect was anywhere from three to five hundred yards away from the former president. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, believe he had intentions to fire this assault style rifle with a scope on it um, towards the former president as he got close. So one of the things, Thomas, we're doing now is driving around the golf course. I've asked Destiny just to kind of give us a, a lay of the land here um, to see, is that possible? And what we just saw is um the roads that surround this golf course um are public access you mm -hmm. know except for the main entrance there yeah. but it is entirely possible to park as you see in this video here along one of these main roads for a short amount of time i would imagine and um give yourself access to the course using a rifle even if you can't physically enter yeah and we you know as you said you how close he was able to get to the president, they say between 300 and 500 yards. Of course, since the uh, first assassination attempt that happened in Pennsylvania, security around former President Trump has been extremely stepped up. So it seems like those uh, efforts and those measures have paid off. Well, uh, I mean, yes, he's alive. Uh, mm -hmm. Correct. Um, but to the extent he was that, injured as he yeah. 
Right, right. Uh, he was injured, as as you pointed out, in that first assassination attempt. Um, from what I'm understanding, uh, the Trump campaign did ask Secret Service for additional resources, additional security surrounding him, because, of course, any former president, I believe, yeah, that looks like the library does thing. Uh, I'm going to give you a better view because you don't want to keep looking at me here. So we're coming up on what appears to be an other roadblock on the other entrance. Where is this? This is the trans. This is the school board building here. Um, what is an other entrance to the golf club? Um, and you just saw there that entrance was closed. There is a school board building across the street, um, and it looks like we may end up trying to uh, spend a little time here to get better pictures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, back to that point, Thomas. So. The Secret Service uh, denied a request to the Trump campaign for additional security, mm. saying that it just comes down to resources. And as you know, any former president um, has Secret Service protection for the rest of their lives, but it is limited. Mm -hmm. And so that's what was happening on the golf course um, from um, what I've been told, that the Secret Service provided a, a small amount of security around him. Um, you know, whether or not Mr. Trump would have liked the entire golf course to be shut down, uh, you know, I don't have that information. But Certainly. the few uh, Secret Service agents who were with him at the time, here's another uh, police vehicle that was passing by us. The few agents who were with him, the way that they move on the golf course is they stay uh, one or two holes ahead of him and doing exactly what they did yesterday, looking for threats a hole or two ahead of him and that's why they were ahead of him and this suspected gunman was hiding out in the bushes before mr trump even got to that hole because that small uh contingent of secret service agents was with him surrounding him um just just in his immediate vicinity again mm -hmm. not to a large extent like a like an actual president would have where you would probably guess that everything would be shut down yeah and uh so i know that since the arrest we've learned a little bit about the suspected shooters or would-be shooters uh background we know that he has some criminal history uh and to that point he's actually facing uh, a federal charge for possessing a weapon by a convicted felon uh and then i believe the other charge has to do with him filing off the serial number what else have we been able to glean about this person who uh, is now accused in this assassination attempt Right. Um, this is, uh, you know, I don't know if it's an incredible coincidence or not, uh, Thomas, but CBS News realized uh, their, one of their foreign correspondents who's been covering the war in Ukraine um, realized that she had interviewed uh, over the phone, um, not on camera, this suspect, Ryan Routh, Ruth, uh, she called him Ruth, um, she had spoken with him several times over text and, and had one phone call with him when he was in Ukraine because uh, he was he has been critical, uh, at least on social media, of former President Trump. But the contact that the CBS News correspondent had with Ryan was that he went to Ukraine in support of Ukraine, trying to uh, generate uh, support for the country as, of course, they battle Russia. Mm -hmm. There's some procession um, entering here, um, unmarked vehicles, but you can see the flashing lights, so clearly they are law enforcement vehicles. Yeah. So this, um, Destiny, is the, the north entrance to the golf course here, you see, which is uh, obviously being heavily patrolled, but there are cars going through, so you must have some, some need to go through there. Um, so anyway, the correspondent, Thomas, was in touch with Ryan uh, as he was in Ukraine. I guess he was trying to recruit other soldiers from other countries to try and fight against Russia. Um, she, she, she didn't have anything really negative to say other than he seemed to be um, a bit naive. Um, but um, she didn't mention anything about, uh, uh, you know, feelings towards the former president. Mm -hmm. Again, that came from some of his social media. He's been critical um, in his social media, according to reports. But again, this correspondent didn't point out anything um, that would have 
uh, set off, uh, you know, an alert um, to where uh, someone might have feared for the former president in relation to that suspect, Ryan Ruth. Uh, he yeah. was in federal court this morning. Um, he uh, was arraigned, as you said, on those two gun charges. And of course, further charges uh, are very likely forthcoming. Um, the this is federal court because, of course, this is a, uh, a federal crime, um, and uh, the federal government now has five days um, to make a decision about next steps, mm -hmm. um, including a bond, which I would imagine would be very unlikely. Yeah, and uh, I, I know you guys are just getting there, and you probably want to get the lay of the land, so I'll let you go, but I just have one last question. Uh, just uh, going back to what you said, we there have been reports that this uh, individual has had uh, some critical words about the former president online, but we still don't know any sort of potential motive, correct? Correct. Uh, none that I have seen. And by the way, uh, the reason, Thomas, I've turned the camera here is this mm -hmm. looks to be the uh, outer perimeter of the golf course, which uh, you know, just as I described, it's it's lined with trees and bushes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see that chain link fence through the bushes, but just yes. Barely. Um, yeah, again, it is possible to uh, get up to a hole, not there, but presumably on the other side of this foliage. Mm -hmm. um, stopped by the fence but again you could get certainly close um no you know as, as from everything i've seen um there has been nothing direct um posted or um, or spoken uh by that suspect ryan ruth um again that would alert someone of the possibility that um he has a larger issue with the former president Enough so to um, go to a golf, co golf course with a rifle, as mm -hmm. he's been accused of. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go then, so that you can you can gather a little bit more. Uh, you're starting to break up a little bit too, so we definitely want to get you on the uh, out there and, and able to gather whatever you can. I appreciate your time, and uh, you know uh, we look forward to seeing your reports starting uh, New Six at Four. We'll see you then. Thank you, Thomas. Bye, right. everybody. Thank you very much. All right, we are going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we will have uh, New Six investigator Eric Sandoval joining us, talking about Melbourne and some of the issues that they're dealing with insofar as the homeless population there. That'll be coming up in about two minutes. Hello and welcome back to Take Six. I'm streaming executive producer Thomas Mates in for Julie Broughton. Uh, this week, New Six is getting ready to hit the road. We are heading out to Melbourne. We are going to do a special day of coverage 
looking at the city of Melbourne and everything it has to offer, but also some of the issues that is impact that are impacting that community as it grows and develops as so much of Central Florida is doing these days. We are going to check in with New Six investigator Eric Sandoval. Eric, you've been out to Melbourne a few times now, and I know one of the issues that, as we've solicited, you know, uh, story ideas from the community, one of the big issues that we've been seeing over and over and over again has been homelessness, and you went digging into that. Yeah, you know, Thomas, I think every community we've hit so far on Hits the Road, we've heard from the residents saying, you know, the, the homelessness issue is a real huge issue here. Come check this out. What are the solutions? So as you said, we, we got in the car, we went to Melbourne. And yeah, it, it's a huge issue. And I think you, you touched on part of the issue uh, in, your, in your intro to me, and that is the rapid growth that Melbourne has seen. I want to show you at least part of the coverage that we've already produced that aired during our new newscast. Let's take a look at that now. There's about 300 people who sleep on the streets here in the city of Melbourne on any given night. And a lot of them find at least some of the help they need here at the Daily Bread Outreach Center. Is this a usual gathering place every day? Yeah. Under so, the shade? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Jeff Noose is the executive director here. This is our dining hall, staffed by volunteers. He says in the six years he's been here, he has seen the homeless population grow a lot. It's a fun place to work. Yeah. You know, we have the privilege of working with what I like to call the most interesting people in town. You know, these are people who are facing dire situations with a lot of resilience. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get to walk along with them. Cindy Dittmer is the city of Melbourne's community development director. She says the city sees more affordable housing as one of the keys to help curb the homeless issue here. We tried to offer um, things such as impact fee deferrals and bonus um, density bonuses to allow more units to be developed. To lure more things people to, to build lure, affordable housing right, complex. Trying to make it easier to develop affordable housing. Now things are expected to change here over the next few months because a new law takes effect October 1st that basically bans outdoor sleeping throughout the state of Florida. City officials here in Melbourne are still trying to figure out what that means here, just like city officials all over central Florida. We're in downtown Melbourne, Eric Sandoval, getting results, News 6. And, you know, Tom is coming up tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to actually investigate some of the solutions that the city of Melbourne is working on with the Daily Bread. You know, they're sort of collaborating on a, on a few uh, efforts. One huge one is something that they are going to build on, on a vacant lot mm -hmm. uh, right off Sarno Road. It's going to be a huge affordable housing complex. Price tag is 15 to $20 million, if that gives you any idea of how wow. much effort they're going to be putting into this. And, you know, the, a lot of people actually here in the newsroom had the question, what is affordable housing? You know, mm -hmm. does that just mean it's affordable? Uh, you know, it, it, No, it's actually a sliding scale rent. So, you know, if you have a family of four and you go to a, an affordable housing qualified complex like the one they're going to build there in Melbourne, your rent is basically based on how much money you make and then how many people are going to be living there, you know, a family of four. So then they, you know, they use their little chart there and they determine exactly how much your rent is going to be based on your income and the number of mouths that you have to feed. You have to qualify for it. You mm -hmm. have to fill out the paperwork. You have to submit your pay slips. You have to, you know, do all of this stuff in order to qualify. But the um, it's there for people who actually want to take advantage of it. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my next question was, you know, I know oh, we've, sorry we've covered, no, no, you're totally fine. That it, it sets everything up perfectly because, you know, uh, to your point, we've had several of these affordable housing uh, mm -hmm. developments pop up around Central Florida, but, yeah. you know, they're not all on that same sliding scale. And, you know, there have certainly been times where us in the newsroom have been looking at that and being like, who is that affordable for? So it's nice to see that there is something that is accommodating to the individual. Yeah. And, you know, Thomas, to your point, I think um, there may be some confusion, too, among the public. You know, these apartment complex have a certain number of units that are set aside for the affordable housing program. Mm -hmm. The other number of units are set aside for mainstream consumption. So, you know, if if I don't necessarily qualify for affordable housing and I want to live at this apartment complex, my rent may be two thousand dollars. But if another you know person comes in and they qualify for affordable housing based on their income, their rent may be 
cut in half, maybe even more. So their, their rent may be substantially lower than mine. So we may still live in the same apartment complex, but we qualify for different programs. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I think that your your story today is also like of a piece with Justin Warmoth's story that is also airing later tonight, his Boomtown piece, where he spoke with the mayor mm -hmm. of Melbourne talking about all the growth and development. There is a lot happening in Melbourne beyond well beyond just affordable housing. So, I mean, that's this is, you know, the affordable housing is certainly a piece of that. But is this uh, a problem that they are predicting is going going to maybe get worse before it gets better or how are they thinking about that yes and no and you know i think what the city of melbourne is saying is you know we, we have exploded with growth and you know with that growth comes some more tax dollars that they mm -hmm. have to work with and i think that is why they're earmarking so much money to go to providence place i'm failed to mention the name of it mm -hmm. uh, providence place on sarno road and some other programs because they do have a little bit more tax money flowing in as a result of this rapid growth and that growth is coming you know in, in the high tech market you know these incubator projects are moving in of course the mm -hmm. defense and aerospace industry is at melbourne international and then as a result of all that we have more property taxes flowing in because more people are buying their homes. So, um, you know, the, the executive director with the Daily Bread was telling us we are seeing this explosive growth and we are saying, yes, we want to help the lower income residents who still live here. And some of which really don't have a house to, to, to you know, shelter them from the storm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, one one last point, and I think it's an important one that you made right the towards the end of your piece there is this new law going into effect on October mm -hmm. 1st. Uh, I know we've we've been we've been looking at all the laws that are going into effect, but this one has really stuck out to us because what exactly does it mean? It's it's uh, beholden to all of the municipalities to provide beds for these people to prevent this outdoor sleeping. But. Right. You know, it, it's we're a couple of weeks out and how many of those communities say they're actually ready? Melbourne at least appears to be not one of them. Very, very few. And I have to tell you, Thomas, I actually got to sit down with Orlando's police chief, Eric Smith, last week. And mm -hmm. um, it was also on another homeless story. And I asked him, what are you guys doing for October 1st when this new law takes effect? And he said his attorneys are still going over it. Mm -hmm. Because the law, the way the law is written is very, very vague. You know, what what do police departments do with the mm -hmm. homeless population who are caught sleeping on the streets? The jury's still out on that. They yeah. don't know. And so, you know, how it's going to be enforced is really a big red herring right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know that we've done stories also up in Marion County with similar issues. And so it's mm -hmm. it's going to be something we're definitely going to be keeping our something eye on. Something we're going to be watching. Absolutely. Yeah, all across the area. Because, I mean, to your point, you know, if, if you know, just just a sheer numbers, there is, as you said, about 300 homeless people or people mm -hmm. living on the streets of Melbourne every night. The police department could not possibly arrest, fine all of those people. So how is that going to... The jail. You know. I don't think the jail could handle an yeah. influx like that every night. Exactly. And, you know, and, and they wouldn't have the money to bond themselves out of jail or pay the fine. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're creating a bigger problem. That's, that's just something that we're examining as we move yeah. forward with this new law. Absolutely. And, you know, just uh, so that everyone knows, this is just one of the many stories that we are covering as we head out to Melbourne. Uh, I know, Eric, you're going to be there on Wednesday when we go yep. out to Squid Lips on Pineapple yep. Avenue, uh, as long, along with the rest of the investigative team and several members of the New Six Talent. So I know uh, you've always uh, out there. You know, shaking hands, kissing babies, as it were, uh, meeting the <laughs> you know what meeting no, the people. Here's the thing, Thomas. When when uh -huh. we go out, number one, we have a great time. Yeah, this isn't just you know, uh, oh, a boring newscast going out. We actually we have a great time with the people who show up and who who want to meet us. Number one, mm -hmm. number two. As reporters, we walk away with some fantastic stories because yeah. people want to meet you in person and say, "Hey, here's some material I want you to take a look at," and mm -hmm. you know. We, we walk away with some really great stories that yeah. have legs. So if you have a great story, come to Squid Lips on Wednesday, track me down, 
bring me some information mm -hmm. and uh, we'll see if you, we can get you some results. Yeah, How I know people that? have come in with, you know, literal binders of documents and information. I to have received to... them. Yes. yes. So, you know, <laughs> the more information you can bring, the better, the better chance that we can potentially provide some coverage or at least do something to help you. So we hope to see you all at Squib Lips on Pineapple Avenue in Milburn this Wednesday from 4 to 7 p.m. Eric Sandoval, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing your story tonight at 6, correct? Yeah, at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. Thanks, Thomas. Excellent. All right, we will talk again soon.